Okay. So it is 7.05 and I would like to formally uh, welcome everyone to tonight's seminar. So my name is Stan Chambers Jr. I am the president of the Alpha Epsilon Omega Alumni Chapter of Idaho Phi Theta Victoria Incorporated, which covers the triangle. And what we're doing tonight is part of our voter education series. So along with the North Carolina Black Alliance, and the Beta Pi Sigma and Theta Lambda Sigma uh, alumni chapters of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, we have launched a five-part series to increase voter literacy, especially among Black communities, ahead of the November elections. And so this effort allows us to have a better understanding of the value of our vote and what it means to vote, not just voting just because your parents told you to, but actually knowing what your vote means and does. So that is the purpose of this series. And so tonight, we are focusing on how your vote is unique and ways that you can make it to count. And so along with myself, I have three wonderful panelists that are going to uh, share their words of wisdom, uh, give advice, uh, regarding ways to make your vote count. And so first we have Mark Anthony Middleton. Uh, he is uh, a Durham City Councilman. He represents Ward 2. Uh, you joined the council about two years ago? I believe so, am I correct? 2017. So he's been on the city council for three years. And so Mr. Middleton, thank you. Thank you for taking time to talk with us. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Brother President and Sister Basilis. Let me, let me firstly say just how honored I am to be with you. I, this is sacred space and you're having a sacred conversation, so I don't take it lightly uh, to be part. Uh, let me say also on behalf of the entire city of Durham, the government of Durham, uh, that we thank you uh, for what you're doing um, at a very grassroots and organic level, um, educating voters. Uh, it is the most fundamental and basic way to affect our democracy, uh, suffrage, uh, the vote, uh, so this is a timely conversation. I also want to, it's not lost on me how much attention uh, D9 organizations are getting um, and HBCUs, I'll put it in that order. We know that everybody in the D9 didn't go to HBCU, but uh, we know that there, those organizations, those entities are getting a lot of attention. And by extension, I think the black vote in general. So this is an incredibly timely uh, conversation uh, and I want to thank you. So let me get right into it. I am Mark Anthony Middleton. As you said, I'm a member of the Durham City Council, which means that my job is causally linked, hard linked to voting. I'm an elected official. Uh, so I think about voting and I think about voters and I think about the electorate often. I want to uh, firstly say that uh, I think, and, I, and, and let me know when I get to the 10 minutes. I'm also a preacher, so don't, don't wave me off. Uh, so so <laughs> give me 10 minutes to open mic. You must be playing. You I is going to learn tonight, bro. Um, <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we, uh, um, we are in, a, in, in an environment uh, because of COVID-19 where I think we are getting a serious uh, civics lesson on the importance of local elections. Uh, in the absence of strong national leadership, we have watched governors and mayors and city councils step up uh, to fill the leadership void. Um, a lot of people didn't realize just how powerful mayors and governors and councils are uh, when it comes to restricting movement. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that a mayor under emergency powers could close down a business. Um, nobody even thought about mayors in that way. But this environment is really showing us the importance of not just voting when it's sexy, when it's a national election, when there are millions and millions of dollars being spent on national advertisements and yard signs all over the country, but local elections are the bread and butter of the advancement of our people, at least from a political point of view. Um, local elections are extremely important and elections, as they say, have consequences. Um, so who you have in the mayor's chair and the council seat and at, at, in state legislatures, particularly uh, governor's mansions matter. It matters in terms of drawing lines. We see uh, after Barack Obama won, uh, the GOP got busy in taking over city councils, state legislatures and governor's mansions. Why? because lines are drawn at that level. The redistricting can be a, a, a impacted at that level. Uh, you can carve out uh, and, and literally carve away people's voting power uh, by drawing lines. So it's incredibly important that we uh, connect 
what goes on in our life every day at the local level, not just at the national level, but at the local level. Um, and, and, and voting is one way to impact. In, in my, I was gonna say my prior life, I guess I'm still kind of an activist. I, I was part of the leadership apparatus of an organization here called Durham Can. Uh, so in my organizing background, we had this tenet where uh, you either organize money and people. Power is the organization of money and people. Uh, and money, we know in, in, in the American constitutional system, in American democracy is a multiplier, the economic principle of a multiplier. If you got a lot of money, you can, you can, you know, you can amplify your voice, you can buy people off. But if you don't have a lot of money, but you have people, you have a mailing list, you have a contact list, uh, a whole bunch of people moving in concert uh, in one direction, working together, can, can, can uh, serve to counteract the impact of having a lot of money or not having uh, a whole lot of money. Speaking of money, what's up, Zach Hawkins? Uh, big money just got on. Uh, having a whole lot of, of money, either money <laughs> or people. With that, let me segue into this. I spoke about the impact of, of D9 organizations, uh, the, the attention that we're getting now. Um, and, and they're referring to us as, as an army, as a secret army, as Kamala's secret weapon. And let's not miss the power of this moment. Um, we need to be pressing our national leadership of each of our respective families uh, uh, to, to talk, have the, at the next executive level Panhellenic meeting, to talk about how we can harness the power of this moment and codify it. Whether or not we need to have a separate uh, C4 arm of our D9 uh, organization that can, that can endorse candidates, that can hold our own debates, uh, that can hold our own forums. Now is the time for us to strike. So I would, I would just implore each of us that represent uh, different organizations on this, on this call, on this Zoom conference tonight, to, to appeal. I'm, I, I'm lucky. My, my national president of Alpha is local. My outgoing national president is local, Dr. Everett Ward, and our national chaplain is all here locally as well. So I'm, I'm going to be burning up their lines about codifying and pushing the panhandle uh, to have a, a political arm of the divine nine that can, that, can, that can capitalize on this moment, codify it, institutionalize it moving forward. So we won't just wait for the next time one of us is on a national ticket, but there are mayoral races that are pivotal. There are governor, gubernatorial races that are pivotal. Finally, I, I will say that, that the George Floyd moment has also taught us the importance of local elections. Uh, even though de defund the police, is, is, is a national discussion, wherever you may come down on that, on that gamut, on, on, on that spectrum, those decisions are made at the local level. Police chiefs are hired locally. Uh, police officers are hired locally. City managers are hired by uh, uh, city councils, even though I, I'm in a council manager form of government, but it's the city council that, that hires that manager. So I cannot say enough, uh, uh, Sigma Gamma Rho and Iota Phi Theta and, and, and Black Council and, and everybody that's on here tonight, um, that local elections matter, and we've got, we've got to find ways to generate the same type of excitement about electing a mayor or a city council person or a school board as we do a governor or president. Because the moment you walk out your door, the moment you hit a, a public street, when you walk out your door in the morning, who, who's sitting at City Hall has much more impact on your life at that moment than who's sitting in the White House. Um, on so many, you just go down the go go down the list from the garbage cans you pass to the potholes you drive on to the street lights to the cop that pulls you over. Uh, who's in city hall matters. So so I I just put that out to you. I put that challenge out to each of you as well. Um, and I, I would implore each of us to use the platforms. There are some significant. I'm looking at who's on the screen. Some significant platforms represented here on this conference tonight uh, that we would use our platforms to to really bring home the message that local elections are where it's at, to call up our national leadership, to ask for the codification of this moment uh, of D9 organizations and HBCUs, uh, and also to remember, uh, if you have an issue with police brutality or if you're concerned about justice and how black people are treated, the people of color around the country, start with your own city hall, because that's where the hiring decisions are being made. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And before, and we, continue, before we continue, uh, uh, sorry, 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 echo my, echo my, 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 my phone. phone. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, so we have a, we a Q and a, 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 a. Also, so also, if you guys, if you guys have, have 
any, uh, any uh, questions, please don't hesitate to uh, ask them in the comments. And what we'll do is during the discussion, we will stop to take questions. So think of this as a free flowing conversation on, on Zoom. And so uh, Councilman, let me ask you this. So you mentioned regarding being involved on a local level, uh, imploring our organizations to step up their social action, possibly by forming a separate organization. What other ways do you think that we can make our vote count on the local level? I think, you know, we, we, there's something to be said about the power of convening. Um, one of the things that, that um, you know, as a lowly city council person, um, I can't issue fiat or executive orders or directives, but I noticed that a, a lot more people take my phone call now than used to uh, when they see it, particularly when I call from the city hall number. Um, and the power to, to bring people to the table, the power to make connections, to rain make and create a nexus of relationships. I think at the local level, um, we ought to be holding our own debate series as, the not, as D9 organizations. We ought to be leveraging uh, the incredible, how many realtors and attorneys and preachers and doctors and teachers do we have in our ranks across the board? Every major professional uh, uh, niche is represented uh, in our ranks. You, you name it, we've got somebody there. Uh, I think at the local level, uh, outside, in between elections, uh, using all of the, the levers uh, and buttons that we have uh, to pressure government to listen to us because there's another election coming. I don't, listen, every elected official, the day after they get elected, they're thinking about the next election. Uh, and the folk that are calling up and inviting them to the meetings and sending emails, uh, they get attention. Uh, uh, they demand attention. Um, I think at the local level, we ought to be looking into ways in between election day uh, to, to use the power of convening, the power to call folk together, constantly having conversations, constantly asking uh, those that, that we've entrusted with power um, over our lives uh, at the local level, uh, uh, interrogating them and questioning them. Uh, I'm serious about our own debate series, our own license series, uh, to invite folk there, to let folk know that we're not just focused on election day, we're focused on the 300 and however many days between each election cycle uh, uh, there is. Uh, because uh, one thing I'll tell you is, is, is that uh, politicians and elected officials are, are always reading the green, if I can use a golf uh, analogy. We're always looking at the lay of the land. And, and it's not so much self-centeredness because, listen, if you've got, there's 300,000 people, roughly, uh, in Durham. You know, I don't know all of those people, and, and, and I don't know what is, what's important to all of those people. I do know what's important to the ones that are always sending emails to the ones that are always showing up in meetings, to the ones that are always stopping me, you know, in the streets or, or at lunch, walking up to me at lunch at table. That really happened, by the way. The folk that are always walking up to me, uh, 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 I know because folk organize and they, and they, and they, they petition their government. They, they seek redress for their concerns. And there's not an election even close. Uh, uh, they understand the, the power of organizing and the power of petition and the power of asking your government to redress. Listen, we, the best parties I've ever been to have been panhandle parties. We, 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 can, we, can, we can organize a party, we can organize a stroll. You know, we do great work at the national level and all of our conventions, our respective organizations have incredibly, incredible impactful things going on nationally. Let's keep some of that going on locally, across colors, across family lines uh, 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 and, and watch what happens. I did it with Durham Can, watch how attentive elected officials are when you say we got a group of folk in the room and we want to talk to you. Yeah. You ain't yeah. got to tell them what it's about. You ain't got to tell them what it's about. They say we want to talk to you. And now especially, y'all are it. D9 organizations, right. folk are Googling y'all, you know, Kamala <laughs> shouting y'all out. Uh, 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 people like who, who, like we like the skulls now. It's like, <laughs> we, we got these buildings with no windows like they do at Yale. So, so, so let's capitalize on that mystique. Uh, at the local level. Yeah, I, I, if I could jump in, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, Mark Anthony, but I, I would agree with that. I think this is our moment in our time. And there's a, there's a beautiful photo, um, uh, and it happens to be, I think, in Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, with, um, with Hosea Williams and with uh, MLK and with um, you know, my fraternity brother, Jesse Jackson. All of, all of the guys that were in that photo were members of the Divine Nine. And then if you sort of 
start to, um, to peel it back a little bit, so were a lot of, of, of the women who were at the forefront. And, and so, you know, I think that it really is an opportunity for us to use what we naturally do as the, as the councilman was saying. Uh, one of um, the things that I think that has sort of gotten in the way is people feel like, oh, we can't get involved in politics. If you don't get involved in politics, politics will make you. It will make the decisions for you. And the people who, who not only send the emails and, or and organize will get their um, needs met, but for, you know, for the work I do over in the General Assembly, those who are writing you know, those, in, those checks, right? those who have you know, corporate interests Will will make the day um, uh, will make happen what they want to have happen through uh, through through influence and so I mean that boils down to things like Medicaid expansion. There's 750,000 people across the state of North Carolina who don't have access to affordable health insurance option, and most of those people are black and brown. If you know, and, and most of our folks who are in D9 organizations are black folks. And so it impacts us more than we can imagine. And so we're almost not doing the, we do a lot of service, but we're not doing the greatest service that we can if we don't get in and jump in those issues and talk about it. Um, you know, when we start talking about education, we do not have um, enough black and brown teachers in front of our kids. And what the research shows is that when you have uh, black teachers and brown teachers in front of any kid, they do better. And most of us as, uh, the, the councilman said, you know, we are in those professions, right? And so we have to sort of use our ability to convene and talk because we have some amazing, amazing numbers. I think between HBCUs and D9, they're estimating that it's almost 2 million nationally um, between those grads. And then I can imagine what, it's in, what it is in an area like, um, uh, like Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. And so um, it's, it really is, uh, uh, it's funny enough, we are getting Googled uh, quite a bit, Councilman. Um, it is happening. And so even a lot of, that's one thing that you'll see is our enrollment and our membership will probably, interest will go up <laughs> uh, over the next two years. But I do think that um, for, for all the folks who are experts, um, who can talk about, you know, what, you know, it, it means to have, um, you know, COVID-19 rock our community. We have doctors and nurses who can talk about those things. Um, but we have to be willing um, to jump in the game and we have to be willing, as the councilman said, to keep the conversation going. Um, and it's not so much, um, again, that you're trying to, you know, like they said, you know, look at the green and, and look at sort of where things are going, but you have to stay on, on, on a politician's radar. And most importantly, you should never leave a politician to go and make the decisions for you. Now, we trust the, we trust the votes you give us and we are our are, are, are elected officials who try to stay in, in contact, just like, you know, with Barbara, she you know, stays in contact with her constituency. But there are a lot of folks who will just go with the best advice and will just go and make the decisions. And so you, the, a perfect democracy looks like elected officials and citizens walking through that process of decision making and voting and, um, and outcomes together, right? That is the, that's the perfect synergy of what democracy is supposed to look like. And um, if we're, you know, and I don't know, you know, how people are um, thinking about this election cycle, but if, you know, if, if, if because of Kamala's background, you want to support her, right, and say she gets in um, in November, the biggest thing you can do next is get ready for 2022 um, in the midterm elections, because there, there may be a, 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 a majority of her side of the aisle in the House and the Senate. But the minute we don't organize and stay committed in the middle midterm elections, all that's for naught because the other side is going to come in, take over, and then all the things that we need to get done for our kids and for our communities um, will, will fall by the wayside. And so we have to, we saw that happen with President Obama in 2008 and 2010. And so I just I give that backdrop, that story, because if you're talking about what we can do, is keeping the, the pressure on. And the Lyceum series is great. I know um, the MPHC um, is looking at doing a candidate forum uh, here soon, but that has to happen at least once a year. And you also need to, on your agendas, make sure that you give you know, 15 to 20 minutes for local and state officials to get on and talk about what's going on so you can stay informed. 
So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. So let me pose, so somebody asked a question and I wanna pose this to Barbara and then um, uh, Mark and Zach, you guys can jump in. So for those who don't know, uh, Barbara Fushi, I hope I got your name right, uh, is the mayor pro tem for the town of Carborough. So for those in North Carolina, Carborough is right next to Chapel Hill. And so the question posed is, how are we to start this conversation with so many lacking the technology, the education to truly understand the magnitude of their vote? So Barbara, I pose that question to you first. Oh, thank you so much. Um, that is a good question um, because because of the COVID-19 restrictions on gathering and moving about, um, we are definitely behind the eight ball as far as being able to canvas and reach out to folks the way that we usually do. Um, technology is an issue for a lot of folks. Um, broadband access, you know, you know, that's a thing. Um, and even within some town limits, um, folks just don't have that access. They don't have a laptop. They don't have internet access. So, you know, that, that is a good question that I don't have an answer for, to be honest with you. Um, I use technology. Um, I use my, my sorority. I use my voice on the council. Um, and I think for those that, that feel comfortable, folks have actually started to, to move about some, but I mean, it, it's just how you move about and moving about safely, you know, with the masking and the social distancing. I think there is a way to get out in the community and, and be visible as I've seen my D9 brothers and sisters doing um, with various service projects. Um, so yeah, I think there is a way. Um, a lot of folks are hesitant, uh, but this election is really, really important. So it, it's going to have us doing some things that we probably have not done before. Um, and this COVID has got us all, you know, kind of tied up. So I just, I just advise everybody to do what you're comfortable doing and do what you can do um, from your, from your space. Um, Cause I don't want to tell anybody to do anything that they're uncomfortable doing. We know so little about COVID. We know a lot about COVID, but then there's, there's a lot we don't know. And, you know, there's a lot of chaos and confusion, you know, with voting information and stuff. And I just also want to add in, get your information from a trusted source when it comes to voting, you know, your state board of elections, your local board of elections, um, some of these other well-known grassroots organizations don't, don't believe the hype. There's a lot of, of chaos and confusion out there around voting, and we know where it's coming from. Just don't listen. Get your information from a trusted source. And I hope um, that that helped to answer your question. Yeah, man, you, you have so it. Before, oh, go ahead. Don't, don't believe the hype. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I uh, uh, one of the issues, and I'll pass it over to the uh, most articulate councilman in the state of North Carolina, Mark Anthony Middleton. Um, after this, uh, he's just a master with the words. But you know, this this issue is really um, uh, a topic for me. Uh, though I've lived in Durham for 20 years, I grew up in a small town in eastern North Carolina, and um, there are people that are even inside of Durham, but around our state, um, who don't have access to broadband. And that was I co-chaired the broadband uh, working group in the house, and they piecemealed it. Right, so they a little bit here, a little bit there. These what they call uh, growing great, which are just uh, the ability for people to have you know access to to get a little bit of fiber in their area so they can light it up, versus being bold and saying, "Look, we're going to allow the town of Carborough to work with um, an internet service provider so that they can, in partnership." make sure that everybody has broadband, right? So they did this in Wilson, North Carolina, and, and there's a small town in Kentucky where they've done it. And so North Carolina, because of, again, special interest, because of special interest, they don't want, they say, well, I know that those people in Western North Carolina and Eastern North Carolina and some parts of, of the you know, rural triangle don't have access, but it'll cost us too much to build the infrastructure. So we're gonna let them, um, uh, we're going. We're going. We're still. We're, we're, we know that kids have to go uh, sit outside of a McDonald's to do their homework, but we don't want to do the work. And so the state uh, is the one in this situation 
that has the ability to step up and um, ensure that there is uh, more flexibility um, for broadband to be um, a reality for everyone. And after COVID-19 has exacerbated this, this divide, this digital divide, we absolutely sort of have to close it. And so I, I say all that to say that, you know, when we start talking about, you know, how can we organize and how can we, um, uh, uh, you know, move, move things forward for not only our communities, but for, um, you know, our children, that's one way. And, and, I'm, and I'm giving you exactly who's in control of that issue so that when you're looking for something to do in November, um, you can go and find those folks that we need to get out because they don't care about black and brown folks not having access to the internet um, across the state. Um, and that's just, it's deplorable. The, the thing though that I would say uh, around organizing is everybody's got a Zoom meeting or a stream yard or uh, whatever sort of the case is. And, uh, and I would think that it's, it really does give you the opportunity not only to organize amongst each other, call in elected officials, call in your BOE to walk through to make sure the chapter knows how, um, to work, invite them to your meeting, invite the BOD director to your meeting and have him walk through the specifics so you are, then can be a conduit information into a community. If, um, you know, if, uh, if, if folks want to, um, uh, to, to organize a specific space, um, like, you know, women or um, folks who live in East Durham, like we, we as elected officials, but also with uh, the board of directors, the board of uh, elections can help with getting out that kind of information. And so I think that, I think that that's what we have to do is the space that we're in, we just have to be aggressive in that space. Somebody told me you got to bogart the space. And so people over a certain, a certain age demographic will understand that frame, but we really do have to maximize it. And then before I pass it off to Mark Anthony, he, um, he, he submitted a challenge about, I think it was a thousand men or, you know, black men and, in the area to get together. And, I'm, and I think it may be uh, an awesome thing for the divine nine to put some boots on the ground in March and then get our um, voices out there about the things that we demand and things that we care about. And so Mark, I'll let you talk a little bit about, about your call to action for brothers and sisters. Um, and I, I do believe that we, def we definitely need to march and stroll to the polls. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, brother. And listen, ditto uh, to everything that uh, my friend Barbara and, and, and my friends Barbara and Zach uh, have already said. Um, you know, hey, put it on TikTok. P put it on Facebook. Put put it on Instagram. I mean, I, you know, I, and I, I'm. I, we need broadband access, um, but but folk are being reached somehow. Donald Trump got a gazillion Twitter followers. Yep. In, in, in Appalachia, uh, th these folk are, are, are getting his message. So it's up to it's up to us to exploit every platform that's at our uh, uh, disposal, um, every every medium uh, we have. Um, the access to information is is one of the great civil rights issues of our time. Um, I think it was I, I once heard um, uh, who's your boy Bill Gates say that a kid with a computer connected to the internet in the inner city has the same access as a kid in Beverly Hills with a computer. Oversimplified example, but I, I, it's, it's true, of course, the kid in Beverly Hills has some other stuff at his disposal, but we have to uh, put access to information in people's hands. Um, I will say, uh, so, so, but I, I do think that, you know, I, a lot of students who aren't, uh, and I know some of them personally, who aren't uh, uh, connecting to the internet at home are walking around with a smartphone in their hand that connects to the internet and, and they're interacting with the world in other ways. So I think we've got to exploit every platform at our disposal. Zach, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you that, that follow the media uh, uh, in Durham, I did issue a, a challenge and it's not just me, in conjunction uh, with a number of black men, of course, answering a challenge that was put to us by a black woman. That's no surprise that a black woman birthed uh, uh, the concept. So I want to be very transparent about that uh, to organize a thousand um, um, brothers, black men from every walk of life to stand against violence, to buttress uh, and muscularize already existing initiatives in our community that are aimed at uh, mitigating violence, but also there are brothers who are signing up that are interested and, and have the wherewithal to do direct interventions as well. And I won't get into the specific, specifics of that here, but we're trying to, to every place where our young people are, to put ourselves there. 
uh, in between them and violence. And and for everybody, all the brothers on, on this Zoom conference tonight, we've had wonderful uh, response from every D9 organization, other mentoring organizations. Um, so be looking for that to roll out soon. Zach has been a guest on my radio show a couple of weeks ago. On um, my radio show, we, we dedicated the show to discussing the impact of, of black men, the potential impact of black men in dealing with violence. Um, but let me say this, we're talking about voting tonight. Whatever the thousand black men do does not exempt uh, uh, or nullify the responsibility of government to still fund us. Exactly. We, we, we still need investment in our communities. We still need police that got sense. Uh, we still need uh, 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 folk uh, uh, in our classrooms that are gonna respond to us with cultural competence and cultural uh, sensitivity. So the thousand black men, we, this is and, not or, this is in addition to what needs to be doing, what our government needs to be doing for us. So I'm gonna raise as much sand as I can at City Hall, but I understand also that in addition to the talk that we have with our kids, there's the other talk that we need to have as a community that we know that there's certain things government can't do for us. Um, um, but the stuff that they need to be doing, we need to make sure they do it with money in hand. Uh, but there's some other talks that we need to have in our community too. And that's what I'm hoping that uh, the Thousand Black Men Initiative here in Durham will, uh, will, uh, will begin to address. So I ask for your, your support and prayers on that. And Zach, you're gonna be right up front uh, as a leader and an important voice in that initiative as well. Yeah, and the one thing that I'll, I'd add to that is um, I was having this conversation because I'm uh, again on Zoom and as he said, you know, hosted, you know, Facebook Live show and everybody's doing that this way. So, I mean, I think that's another avenue, right? is for D9 organizations to use that amazing, powerful platform. But one thing that we have to realize is that the, the ideas, you know, that are related to what our community needs, there are forces who don't, who want us to think that fully funding education is radical, right? That, you know, doing all the things that would absolutely benefit us are somehow something we can't pay for. And, um, and something that, are, you know, is just, you know, out of the blue or, you know, very far-fetched. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. And so I think that um, one of the, um, the, the conversations that we can, you know, have collectively as D9 organizations, uh, you know, is look at platforms and figure out, you know, collectively, you know, and even based on our national tenants and our national pillars, like what do we think is important? Let's put our stake in the ground. And then we, we vote in 2020, then we turn around and we, you know, and have, you know, uh, semi-annual forms with those elected, then we vote for, you know, people like Mark Anthony in 2021, right? And then we, and then we hold his feet to the fire, you know, after, after he gets in there, right? Does that make sense? And so I think that we have to like set and understand what is important to our communities on all levels across the spectrum and, uh, and then, you know, and, and do that because the, the ideas to move our people forward have always been viewed as radical um, until they were done. And, um, and I think the, the wave of activism that we're seeing, especially from our younger um, D9 members, um, they, they, don't, they don't have time to wait. They're young and they still don't have time to wait, right? They, are, they want what they want and they want it now. And I think we sort of have to join um, that effort because uh, we can't continue to let poor communities remain poor without pouring in, in the resources. And as Mark Anthony said, um, we have to make sure they, they have the money in hand because it's there. Uh, it is, is there and then sometimes it's, it's plentiful. But one thing that I've heard from, you know, a national candidate, he said a, a couple of years ago, is if you show me your budget, I'll show you your priorities. And we have to make sure that we're at the table um, to make sure that those priorities are set. Excellent points, excellent points. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that if you have a question, uh, you can ask the question in the chat. There's also a Q&A feature that you guys can ask your questions and we will uh, bring it up during the conversation. And so speaking of, I just want to mention a few things that were brought up in the chat. Uh, Barbara uh, mentioned a good point. I think uh, this is a potential community service project for D9 organizations is to participate in virtual phone slash text banks. Uh, it's also another way to help candidates and get the word out. Let me tell you, I've received so many texts already from various organizations. 
hey, can we count on your vote? You know, things like that. Um, I was in Florida and I'm still getting texts from organizations in Florida regarding Florida based issues. And I have to remind them I haven't lived in Florida in almost three years. So they have your information. And so since we know that these tactics are being used on us, uh, we could flip it and use it to our advantage as well. Uh, another question that was brought up was, what about collecting hotspots for students who don't have internet access? I think that is a great uh, initiative for our organizations. Um, one person wrote that, uh, with the pandemic, how do you feel we can better help others understand their options to vote? Councilman Middleman, Middleton mentioned being a minister. With churches being out of norm, what suggestions do you have for how to reach church followers? I think that's a good point. Uh, I'll have Mark uh, start off since he is specifically mentioned. Uh, but then we're going to, let's go with Barbara next after Mark. Sure. Uh, however, they're asking them to send their tithes in. Whatever medium they're using uh, for tithes and offering, you can also use to encourage them to vote uh, and to educate them uh, on voting as well. Um, churches have been um, challenged. Um, it, it, you know, it's interesting. Um, th there's a perfect storm, and not just for churches, but any not-for-profit organization. But this is perfect storm. We are at a time when people need the most help. And during the time people need the most help, that's the time when giving to charitable organizations goes down. And for most folk, uh, uh, the first thing that goes is, is giving to the church at times, you know, it, it, in, in tough times. For, for, and this is statistically proven. For most people, that's the first thing that goes, if you're doing it at all. Because uh, contrary to popular belief, the overwhelming majority of the of people who go to church are not tithers. The overwhelming majority of the people do not give 10% of their income to the church. So, so, so that's the first thing to go, but watch this. At the moment where we're cutting back on charitable giving is the exact moment when most people are coming to the, the, the organization saying we need help. So this perfect storm, there's this, this, this confluence of these streams where lower giving, greater need. And folk are looking at you saying, you know, well, ain't you got nothing saved up? Um, restaurants are going out of business after two weeks. Nobody's dashing in. Didn't y'all save up some of the money you sold, uh, uh, made for them sandwiches or, or, or anything like that? So, so I think using the platforms that we're using, churches are on Zoom, churches are on Facebook Live. You know, um, any it, it, whenever we ask uh, uh, or however we're asking attendees for money or for them to to uh, keep up with their commitment, their financial commitment, those same platforms can be used for voter education and voter turnout. What better backdrop do we have now to talk about the importance of voting than the situation we're in right now as a country? If, if we never understood that elections have consequences, there are 178,000 dead Americans. No, and then the national leadership did not uh, uh, initiate the virus, but the response, the response surely cost some people their lives or the lack thereof of response. Elections have consequences. You got problem with police, uh, we have we are now seeing police being charged and arrested and fired almost instantly. Did anyone think we would ever see that? Where 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 not not nearly enough. I'm not saying we've turned the corner. The millennium is here, but but just even five years ago, could you imagine uh, 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 police officers being fired quickly uh, as they were in Atlanta or or charged quickly uh, after you know what we've been yelling about and screaming about for years as, as black people. Um, those things are happening. Donald Trump uh, didn't order those firings and the attorney general, those were mayors. Those were city managers. Those were council people uh, at the local level. Uh, so for every city that we, we pour into our streets for to protest somebody shot in the city, in that city, there's a mayor somewhere, or a council manager, some, a council councilor somewhere, or a city manager, or a legislator in the state legislature somewhere that can exercise influence, can pick up a phone and say, hey, we need to take action. That's because of local uh, elections. Um, so that's a long answer to say, if they get in ties, they can get people to the polls as well. All right, Barbara, thank you, Barbara. Uh, was this the question in the chat about, from Lakeisha? 
Basin? Yes. yes. Better help others understand uh, their options to vote? That's the question? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to go back to um, the church. Um, even though none of us are going in the building, the church still has a platform. Um, and it is up to the pastor how that platform is used. I know in, in some churches, um, you know, the politics, eh, they, they like what they walk in a, a fine line with that. And it's just kind of like mm, a little bit, but not a whole lot. Right. Might say something, you know, every now and then. So, um, I say all that to say the church still has a platform. It just depends on how how your pastor um, decides to use it. And we are still in the midst of a global pandemic. So I, I just ask everybody to use their best judgment and do what you're comfortable with as far as trying to push out information about voting. I am not gonna tell anybody to hit the streets and go knock on people's doors because that's not gonna have you know a good result. But certainly there, there are things um, like uh, virtual phone and, and text banks. There are things that can be organized to, to reach voters. You know, if you can get your hands on some voter rolls, you know, folks that haven't voted in a while, there's a lot of things that can still um, be done, even though we're not able to like really get out into our neighborhoods and into the community as we've done in the past. Uh, we just gotta be a little bit more creative. And again, it's about your, your comfort level. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Zach, anything you would like to, to add? Yeah, I think uh, Lakeisha asked uh, the question about the, the digital divide as well with elections and, um, you know, that encompasses the church and I, you know, nobody knows better than the, the pastor, right? Um, you know, I, about not only getting donations, but using the platform for, for the greater good. And that really is what it boils down to, is um, if you don't think that your, your congregation is using their, um, their platform during this time to talk about the importance of voting and the importance of supporting initiatives that help the congregation, then that's something that you gotta raise with your, your, your trustees. And that's something you gotta raise you know, with your pastor very, very directly. And, and I know Mark Anthony can speak to this. You don't have to, um, one thing they say to black pastors a lot, they try to threaten them with the 501c3 status. It's not a thing. It really is not a thing. As long as you're not there, you know, openly endorsing a candidate, even though churches that are not, that don't like us do it all the time. Um, as long as you're not do doing that and, and, you know, straight up doing, you know, political, you know, activity that's, you know, partisan in nature, you can talk about the bedrock of democracy, which is voting, and you can talk about issues, and you can um, bring candidates in to talk about those things. The church does not have to be devoid of those things. And so I think that's a direct, they saw the power of the church in the 60s and the 70s and, and how it's continued to sort of bring us where we are now. And they have, have put that fear in for a lot of pastors and namely a lot of older pastors. And, and I think that that's something that, you know, as folks in D9, we have to push back on because there's an amazing opportunity. And I will say this, if your church does not have or has not converted to the technology, then help them, right? Help them, you know, let's, let's find somebody in the church that knows how to do Zoom and, and let, them, let them do that. Um, help them with the, uh, the new church newsletter to incorporate information from the Board of Elections on how, um, you know, to, to, get out, to get out the vote. And most importantly, uh, we still can have souls to the polls where the church can organize on different days and different times once the early voting period is open for people to go, right? And literally go down the road. Sister, Sister Jackson, have you voted already? Nope. Well, let me make sure you got you get the church van. Does that make sense? Like we we literally can do those things without violating anything related to your, your 501c3 status. And so I, I wanna again I, I say that again because um, uh, you know, there's a lot of fear that gets put in and it's just, it's just not warranted. Um, and, uh, and that speaks also to the digital divide, um, uh, is that all, you know, there are a lot of churches who are already doing this, right? Um, and there's some that have had to, to jump on it and make it happen. And I do think that, 
Um, you know, as we are part of congregations and see others that are not, it really is part of our obligation. So we don't necessarily have to do it for them, but we definitely need to connect them to a resource to get out because we want our churches to thrive, but we also want them to be absolute and awesome uh, resources for our community. And then lastly, I'll talk about that, um, the digital divide that exists in, you know, in, in school systems across North Carolina again. Um, please step up and, and you, know, if, you know, the Durham Public Schools Foundation, DPS, are trying to close that digital uh, divide by not only raising money, but they're trying to do it through um, making sure that there are hot spots. And so let's, you know, ask your school system how, how you can help. Look at your DHA communities or your housing authority communities and find out what's going on there to make sure that at least among the, us, at least among us have the opportunity uh, to connect. And so I, we can't be passive in this is what I'm trying to say. We have to be active and overly aggressive participants in finding something and then saying something about it. It's not, it's not the kind of good trouble John Lewis was talking about, but this is good enough trouble. Very good points, very good points, thank you. And so I see the, the chat uh, getting a little busy, which I love, and we're going to get to your questions and comments. Uh, but first, I know that Barbara had some slides that she wanted to present. Just wanna ask her if you still wanted to present those slides. Are you asking me if I still want to present the slides? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we're ready to go. I mean, you don't have to, but they're, they're there. So, so yeah, I do just kind of um, want to present the slides. These slides were uh, prepared by our town clerk um, to talk uh, a little bit about the job of a council member, just, just the, the basic job council member, uh, Mark Anthony Middleton from Durham has done an amazing job just um, talking about the politics of it all um, at the local level. And there is a lot of politicking uh, at the local level. Um, uh, you can go to the next slide. So um, I govern in Carborough, I hold a seat in Carborough. Um, there are approximately 22,000 people in Carborough. Um, I am the only African American that serves on this council um, that uh, presents its own challenges and definitely a much higher level of understanding and patience. Um, so our council consists of a mayor and six council members. Um, I am elected by the citizens of Carborough. I was elected in November of 2017 by um, council member uh, Mark Anthony Middleton, we were elected in the same cycle. And elections are held every two years. That is for the mayors. The mayors run every two years. Uh, the council members, we serve four-year terms. And I am up for re-election next year. Next slide. So what do council members do? Again, um, council member uh, Mark Anthony Middleton, he laid a great foundation. Um, about it. Um, we vote on matters that establish policy and uh, make laws in the town. And we should uphold our oaths of office. Um, we're also held to a code of ethics. And um, a quorum of our council or a majority, we make final decisions for the governing board. And we do follow Robert's rules of order, you know, as we take votes. And we make all policy decisions for the town. And sometimes we even act as judge if it's a quasi-judicial hearing when sworn testimony is used to make decisions. Um, that was one of my toughest votes in October of last year. Um, it was quasi-judicial, which means um, the council is acting in the role of a judge. And we are only supposed to take into account um, sworn testimony from uh, folks who have that knowledge base. Um, and that would not mean just, um, just somebody from, you know, from the community, like a constituent as somebody who has to have some type of education, like maybe on lighting, um, you know, or something along those lines. And it has to be that type of sworn testimony from an expert, um, that we would take into account to make that decision. And, the hard vote that I took in October of last year, um, it was planning and zoning. 
and um, it had to do um, with a commercial development that would sit adjacent to an older, um, more established neighborhood in Carver. We got a lot of pushback, you know, from from that neighborhood, and um, that was probably one of the hardest votes uh, that I had to take. And uh, those are the types of things, you know, that you that you hear about later and that you have to go through um, when you're put into those situations. Um, local governing boards do a lot with planning and zoning. If you look around in your neighborhood sometimes and you say, oh, why is that over there? Why did they allow that development there? That is your local governing board making those types of decisions about that family dollar in that neighborhood or that strip mall over there or that storage facility adjacent, you know, to, to a neighborhood where those folks would probably want um, some type of restaurant or something. Um, next slide. Um, mayor Pro Tem, which is me, uh, Vice Mayor, um, this uh, appointment came at an organizational meeting after an election, uh, which was um, last year, there was an election last year, it was not my cycle, of course. And uh, the council elects from, elects from its members a mayor pro tem to serve at the council's pleasure. So my powers and, and duties during the mayor's absence or incapacitation, um, and we follow the general statute right here that's, that's referenced here um, for that. So those were the slides that I had. I did want to um, just talk just real briefly um, about why uh, I decided to run. Um, so representation, right? Um, so wanting to have a seat at the table and wanting to be a voice in the room um, is so critical. Um, I have a lot of community activism and engagement experience through various organizations and causes. And um, that has helped me tremendously um, since I've been an elected official. And I also wanted to be a part of growth and change where I live. Um, and for me, it's about continuing to work for an affordable and equitable community where everyone um, feels welcome here in Carboro. And I do want to, to go back to the representation um, piece. I feel really strongly about um, the 10 percenters <laughs> here in Carborough, uh, the folks that look like me and, and the folks that see I'm there and they'll come to me and they'll say, you know, Barbara, you know, we want traffic calming in our neighborhood. We don't know what to do. You know, what's the process, right? So, I mean, that, that makes me feel good to have them to come to me, right? And to ask me, you know, and it makes me feel good to be able to give out that guidance, you know, and that information because what I've found since I've been in the seat is that a lot of times people just don't even know all the resources that, that come through town hall. The power of a town manager. I think uh, council member uh, Middleton mentioned that the power of a, of, of a town manager, you know, and just in everything that happens, you know, within the town um, and local local politics, they do matter and who sits in those seats, it matters even more. Um, stormwater runoff, your town's budget, you know, what's allocated in the budget, um, the tax rate, property tax rate, lots of planning and zoning. It determines how your, how, your, how your city looks, how your town looks, how your neighborhood looks. Um, stormwater management, and I'm just, just like popping some off, you know, your sidewalks, you know, your trash pickup. All this is tied to who is sitting in those seats. And it's critical to just to just know who those people are and know who they're going to be advocating for, you know, and where they've been, right? What what have they been tied to? What organizations? What causes? All that matters because what it'll do, it'll guide you in your vote, and you'll be like, mm, they, they don't sound like somebody I want to vote for. They're not interested in the same things I am, right? So. I say all that to say, and I'm gonna to go to voting really quickly, I'm gonna be done. I wanna say three things about voting real quickly because I think somebody else is gonna talk about voting later. Number one is have a plan about voting, have a plan. Mail-in ballot, you're gonna go vote in person, you know, whatever. My husband and I have, have put in applications for the mail-in ballot. Um, 
so I feel like we have options. You know, we could do the mail-in ballot or we could go vote in person. It just depends on what's happening um, November 3rd. And I said this earlier, get your voting information from a reliable and trusted source. Stay away from the chaos and confusion. Stay focused on that trusted, um, that information from a trusted source. And, and important, vote the entire ballot. Everybody is, is really focused on the presidential race, and I get it, I get it. But also be focused on your folks in the General Assembly. You know, be focused on your judges. You know, the judges are just as important. Chief Justice Beasley, let's not forget about her. You know, she's gonna need the vote. You know, she needs support. So vote the entire ballot up, down, through, all up in the ballot like all the way through, not just president. People so focused on that, but, but you know, vote the entire ballot. So I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I'm, I'm happy to be here tonight and, and share, share the panel with, with uh, the esteemed representative, Zach Hawkins, and um, my brother over there in Durham, Council Member Middleton. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Barbara. So we were supposed to have a representative from uh, one of our local board of elections, uh, but that person was unable to make it this evening. But um, to Barbara's point, uh, I do have some slides that relate to voting information. And uh, one of the points that Barbara made was to do your homework, do your research. And so I'm going to share my screen and uh, just a few quick points. First, do your research after some soul searching. Um, you really should think about what are your values and beliefs as a person and which candidates support those, your values and beliefs. And so how do you find that information? You can go to individual candidate websites. You can go to, uh, if you're looking at somebody on the state or federal level, you can go to the General Assembly's website. You can go to the congressional websites where they have a tally of that person's voting history. Uh, there's a lot of information out there right now in terms of what's, what's factual, what's false. And so websites like politifact.com uh, are, they check out those facts and they say whether it's true or not. Um, also, if I can go to the next slide here, uh, get ready to vote. Uh, for those in North Carolina, the North Carolina State Board of Elections website has a ton of information from voter registration to absentee voting to where you can vote. Uh, if you're a registered voter in North Carolina, you should have received a uh, registration card by now. Uh, FYI, you don't need that card to vote, nor do you need an ID in North Carolina to vote. You might hear some things to the contrary, but not true. You do not need an ID to vote in North Carolina. Uh, also, shameless plug, uh, if you go to triangleiotis.org slash NC Voting FAQs, uh, we have a series of questions that are related to voting, uh, to FT voting, uh, regarding the coronavirus. If you're a college student uh, and you go to school in an area where you don't live, can you still vote? Uh, the short answer is yes. And so that information is on the triangleiotis.org website. So there's a lot of talk about absentee voting in North Carolina, and I'm going to skim through this. Uh, I would, these slides will, again, be on the triangleiotis.org uh, afterwards. And so in short, with absentee voting, you, you don't need a particular reason to uh, absentee vote in North Carolina. If you don't want to be in line, you can, you can do it and request a mail-in ballot. Uh, so some deadlines to pay attention to, and I'm going to read this. So a signed and completed state ballot, absence, state absentee ballot request form must be received by the County Board of Elections Office no later than 5 p.m. on the Tuesday before the date of the election. So for this year, that is 5 p.m. on October 27th. And for civilian absentee voters, uh, once the application and certificate is completed with all the relevant signatures, you can return your ballot to your respective county board of elections no later than 5 p.m. on election day. Now, you can also go to an early voting site 
or a polling site on election day to drop off your ballot as well. And so you've heard a lot of talk regarding uh, the postal service and whether you're, you can get your ballot in on time, you can mail it, it's going to count. Here's what I did, personal experience. So when I received my mail-in ballot or a form, I filled it out. And then I, I live in Durham County, and I went to the Durham County Board of Elections. Outside the Durham County Board of Elections, there is a box where you can fill in, you can drop off your form. And so uh, that's the best way to do it, is to do it in person. Uh, for those in North Carolina, if you want more information on absentee voting, uh, there is a website on the bottom. Again, these slides will be on triangleios.org afterwards. Uh, and of course, don't forget to vote. No point in doing all this research and all this prep if you're not going to get in the game. So vote, <laughs> whether absentee or in person, just vote. Uh, and of course, the follow-up. Uh, so your candidate won, now what? So some of the things you can do is you can follow your favorite news website for stories on that person. You can also sub Google Alerts if you're that interested in what your candidate does. Uh, with all these bodies of government, city council, county government, general assembly and state level, and Congress, uh, you can follow their public sessions, uh, especially with the general assembly and Congress. Uh, things get done in committee meetings. Uh, I can tell you that I've had some I worked for an organization where I work closely with the General Assembly, and I can tell you things get done in committee hearings. So those are the things you really, really want to pay attention to. And of course, if you are in support of a particular cause, let's say you're really um, support of Medicaid, there are organizations that follow these issues. And so you can become involved with those organizations, sign up for their newsletters, and things like that. So let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, and then, um, so before we get to the rest of the Q&A, um, I wanted to go back to Zach, if you will. I understand there was something that you wanted to add as well. So about, um, about absentee or, yeah, the uh, I do want to you know you know chime in on that as a as a member member of the General Assembly. I so I worked on both versions of that. Um, you know, making it a little bit more fair um, for that process uh, to happen. Um, and uh, just a few sort of you know details is that you only need one signature um, if you are requesting an absentee ballot. And after September first, you can you can request through the Board of Elections online. And so uh, we made that decision. Um, because again, we talked about technology tonight. There's no reason that we should not make it that much easier for someone to request it. And um, and, the, and again, going back to the reason of only one uh, signature, there are a lot of folks who live in congregate facilities like nursing homes, and, um, and 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 again, you have college students who that's a sort of congregate facility. But most people live alone across North Carolina, and we saw the data. And um, you know, again, it was a it was an unintended barrier to, um, to 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 the ballot box by not allowing just one one signature to for, as a verification, and that that can be a, a local um, notary uh, or someone who is you know a direct direct family. Um, but I I I, I want to make sure that people don't get discouraged because in North Carolina um, we were able to. To gain access to federal, um, uh, you know, Help America Vote Act dollars that uh, poured in resources not only to ensure that people could, you know, equally and safely access their um, their uh, their uh, early voting site, um, uh, but also to make sure that there was a lot of voter education, a lot of infrastructure, and so um, in conversations with, you know, with our you know state and local BOE. Um, the preparation that they're taking to ensure that um, that you know you have the the right amount of hours so that you can you can go um, you know you know not have to wait in line and then they follow all the social distancing they're making sure they clean the machines you know all of those things are in place so that you don't have to worry about what you saw happen in Wisconsin and Georgia right North Carolina has 
uh, learn from those lessons and you had a lot of folks, I'm glad to be among them advocating um, in, in, in the General Assembly to ensure that North Carolina um, got it right. And um, it, one thing that you, um, you know, should encourage is, is literally going down the line, especially anyone who's over a certain age, make sure that they, uh, they request it. Because as he just listed, um, if you get it and sign it and decide that you want to take it in, you can still do that, right? Um, and that's really important for people to know. Um, but uh, if you don't request it early, we, you know, we, we, we can't, uh, we can't uh, um, you know, we don't know what will happen if, you, if people request it at the last minute. And so as Barbara mentioned, the plan is so important. Do it early. Um, and then, you know, I think secondly, the early voting period is about 17 days, a little over two weeks. And then there'll be a couple Saturdays and Sundays that are in there. And so it's a lot of time um, for people to find the most convenient opportunity, not only for you, but for uh, your family, um, especially, especially people who are over um, a certain age. And so I'm, I'm glad to, you know, sort of stand, you know, and be helpful with you all um, to walk through those issues. I was, I was um, a part of, you know, making it a little bit better uh, in 2019. And then we just, in the 2020 session, put all of the things you just saw into place so that North Carolina could be in the best possible position for absentee voting and voting in general. Thank you, thank you. And one thing I do wanna add that if you decide to mail in your ballot, mm -hmm. your quote unquote election day, if you will, is actually 14 days before November mm -hmm. 3rd. So do keep right. that in mind. Yep. Uh, I just want to go through uh, some of the questions in the chat box real quick. Uh, there is a question, um, I don't know if any of our panelists will have to answer. If you request a mail-in ballot and receive, but you change your mind to vote in person instead, do you have to submit your ballot or, or fill out the ballot as usual? I imagine you can just go yeah. ahead and vote as normal. It's yeah. the same ballot, I think, isn't it's, it? Yeah, so, so what you, you can do one or two things. You can, um, I get my ballot at home, I fill it out and say, you know what, I'm just gonna go turn it in. I can go to my board of elections and turn it in, as you said, five, before five o'clock on election day and it mm -hmm. counts. They will make sure that that's taken care of. Or, you know, I get it and they say, you know what, I don't wanna use this ballot. I want to just go into my precinct or into an early voting site and cast about, have them give me a ballot and go through that process. You can do that too. You're not bound by any way, it's flexible enough for you, uh, for you to choose. And so that, that, that I wanna make sure that people understand, like if you request it, um, uh, but you know, you know, change your mind. Um, the, the thing that's also important is that there will be people there to help you too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one thing I wanna share is that um, the, the chief judges and uh, the board of election volunteers are there to make sure that you walk, you can walk through that. So if, if you have any confusion, you can stop um, when you get to your BOE, to your early voting site, or to your precinct on election day and, and ask someone. But I do want to repeat, if you get your, if you request your absentee ballot and, um, and want to decide that you want to take it in person, go to your board of elections before five. If you get your um, absentee ballot um, and decide, you know what, I don't want to vote absentee. I just want to do it the way that I've done it before, where I physically go into the booth and do it, you can switch and do that uh, too. And there will be no penalty and your vote will still count. But if, if, if you decide to mail it, don't, forgot, don't forget that you mailed it and then go in and, and try and vote uh, on election day as well because they frown upon that. That's right, that's right. <laughs> that, yeah, that is true. Make sure you don't do both. <laughs> yeah, make sure you don't do both. <laughs> Barbara, I saw that you um, had your hand up. Was there anything that you wanted to share, talk about? What did you just say? Yeah, your hand was up in the, um, the panel. Oh, I thought, you said, I thought you said Deborah. I was like, who is Deborah? I'm sorry, <laughs> Ashley. Um, <laughs> it's all love. It's all love. That D9 love. So um, what, what I wanted to say, I wanted to go back to, um, I saw some questions in the chat that, um, we're asking about uh, things like precinct information and stuff like that. 
I can't tell you how many people come to me and just say, um, look, Barbara, just tell me who to vote for. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, you know, it's a lot to research the candidate, um, you know, um, to find out who they are, what their issues are. Um, as far as the the precincts, I think somebody had asked in the chat about finding out about uh, precincts. Um, I know in Orange County, we have a Orange County Democratic Party that, you know, has like all that information. I'm not sure, um, you know, if, about Durham, but I know that's where, I know I get a lot of information from there, but also um, uh, the Board of Elections, your local Board of Elections would, you know, would have information, but it's just a matter of people having to look for the information, right? And sometimes folks just don't, they just don't, they just don't want to look um, for the information. But I think, I really think it's inherent upon us, you know, to continue to push information out to people, you know, if, if we know something, share it, right. you know, if we can help somebody, you know, put them on the right track. Hey, look, this is your precinct. You know, this is where you go. This is the early voting schedule. You know, share the information any way that you can. Share it by phone, share it by email, share it on social media, share, share, share. If you got the information, share it. Yeah. That's, and that's, that's the way, oh. that's the way it's going to have to go now anyway with COVID. That's going to be the best way to do it because we can't gather and, and do stuff the way that we used to. Go ahead, uh, Representative Hawkins. So. No. Well, sorry, sorry, sorry to cut you guys off, but for the rest of the time, I want to kind of get through these questions real quick because it's already 8.16. So I do want to give um, everybody's question some equal time. But actually, this next question, I think it's for you, Zach, anyway. Um, what is the plan for precincts for voting and protection, not just from the pandemic, but from possible intimidation? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, we, um, you know, through the General Assembly, through your local county, um, you know, parties, through uh, the North Carolina Democratic Party, but also through the BOE, um, there are an army of, of, of lawyers called voter protection lawyers. There's a voter protection hotline that if you get to um, a, a location and you see someone that's standing outside and is blocking you away, right? Um, then you have someone, not only will there be law enforcement there, but you also have a reporting mechanism inside to let people know that that kind of intimidation is, is happening. Um, the reason for that is that, especially in Durham and Mark Anthony, I know you, you know, remember this, um, uh, in might have been 2008, um, probably 2008, but definitely in, again in, in 2016, uh, there were people that were trying to do that. And, and, not only were they trying to intimidate, but they were trying to get false information, right? Mm -hmm. So that you, um, you know, oh, there's a mail that says that you're supposed to vote on November 9th. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, and so you have to make sure that when you see stuff like that, you post it and you send it to, uh, you, you post it on social media, put them on blast, but then you also send it to your board of elections um, and your, your local sort of county party, whichever party you are a part of, so that somebody um can can research it right and ensure that this person you know gets a cease and desist right because they should not be doing those kinds of things um but back to uh voter protection there are lawyers and multiple lawyers in every single county between um you know when the when the vote voting process starts to the day that it ends out making sure that um there if there needs to be an injunction filed to keep polling locations open because uh you know the machines aren't working or the lines are too long or there are, again, people trying uh, to intimidate, all of those things can be, uh, can be handled by those voter protection lawyers, even if you just have questions. Um, in 2016 in Durham, there were, um, I think, three, two or three precincts where the voting machines went down. And because we had voter protection lawyers on it, they had to stay open a little bit longer while they were fixing um, you know, the machines. Um, one thing that we also, because of the current climate that has been um, fostered by the current occupant of the White House, um, <laughs> we, we can expect across the state of North Carolina that some people will resort to um, old school intimidation um, tactics. And so, um, I, I, again, I, I, that's, we're, we're ready for it. Um, but I, but I do want, and I, and I'm glad to share, and I know that you all will 
find your, your local parties and your BOE to, to find those hotlines because people need to have that um, locked and loaded. If you see anything that doesn't sound right or look right, um, you call them so that they can, they can intervene. All right, so for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip to the next question here. Uh, how can we connect people with registering to vote? And I will give this one to Barbara. What was the question? How can you help people with registering? Uh, I didn't... Right, how can you connect people with registering to vote? Um, local Board of Elections, of course. Um, there are also some, some grassroots um, organizations, um, and, I, and the one I'm thinking about, it won't come to me right now. Mark Anthony or You Can or, Vote, or, you can vote uh, for one. Uh, that's one. Um, also, uh, NAACP chapters, you know, across the area are putting out a lot of information, a lot of voting information and voter protection information as well. So. Um, registering to vote, I, I, my first stop would be your local board of election, um, you know, to get that trusted information. And you can vote as, as a trusted source as well. And I believe there is a question regarding where people can vote. And so if you go to the State Board of Elections website, you can type in your address mm -hmm. and it will tell you uh, where you can vote, what districts you're in, things like that. And mm -hmm. so let me, this will be the last question and then we'll get to our closing here. Uh, the question is, has there been any consideration given to using voting machines that provide oh. voters with a copy of the casting ballot? Uh, <laughs> the rationale being, if there appears to be voting irre irregularities at a precinct, we have to trust the local election board and they might be the problem. I guess this is the exact question. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're explaining one of the longest days in the General Assembly <laughs> this cycle. Um, it came down to um, one vote that determined whether or not we were going to push the state to buy new and what we thought was reliable um, equipment that would give what they call a paper trail. And, uh, and what we sort of decided on is you know, a lot of, most of the counties had just bought theirs, um, you know, and most of these machines sort of last a few cycles. So it would have put, without state appropriation, it would have put a lot of those counties in a financial bond to have just purchased and then purchased again. So the plan is, is in 2021, um, as, as we sort of modernize our, our process is to get, to make sure that every county has access to those who give a, a paper trail and, um, you know, paper receipt because it, it, it makes sense because um, one of the things again that happened in the 2016 elections is just that like people, you know, I'd vote for, you know, Barbara Fushi or, or Mark Anthony Middleton and it said you voted for John Jackson, right? And, um, and without sort of something in your hand to say, this is what I said I was going to do, um, uh, it puts everybody in a bind. And so you don't find it out, honestly, sometimes until the vote uh, to the vote is tallied and when you have your official canvas. And so we are working to do that, um, but it was a huge battle in the General Assembly this last cycle. Um, but most people are, are in, in the mind that we need to make sure that um, voter integrity, uh, that voting machines are part of the voter integrity process. People should be able to trust that they cast their ballot, they say they're gonna uh, vote for this candidate because they believe in them and that the, the systems that that government will be in place and will be reliable. Thank you, thank you. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, this effort is in part through a number of organizations, and one of those organizations being the Thale and the Sigma alumni chapter of Sibin Gamero Sorority Incorporated. And so, I want to have uh, Shakima Priester, who is part of the planning committee for this series to, she wants to talk about precincts. So, Shakima. Thank you for introducing me. I'm also um, the African American Caucus for the Democratic Party in Durham, North Carolina. I'm the secretary. And I want to talk to you all about precincts. Precincts are supposed to represent the community they are in. And we see with COVID-19, there are a lot of precincts in African American neighborhoods that are not organized. And so I just want to charge everyone, especially members of the Divine Nine, to own their communities. 
and look into becoming precinct officials. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very important. And a quick question about that. I know in some areas, being a precinct official is paid. And so I don't know if it's like that. It's like that in Durham. And um, one of the ways to apply to become a precinct official is on the Board of, um, Board of Elections website. Right. So if you are in Durham County, you will go to the BOE website, click under I want to, and then become an official, precinct official will be a tab that you can um, select and apply. And I also uh, want to point out on that same website, if you don't know where to vote, um, you can find your precinct there as well. Well, if I can, Thank you. Um, if, if I can, one thing to add to Ms. Priester's um, talk is uh, in the recent law that we passed um, in, with, uh, regarding um, you know absentee and voting process, as an elected as a uh, precinct official, you don't have to live in your precinct. That used to be the law that if I lived in precinct one, I, would, I could only serve as a chief judge or a, a precinct official there. And what we realized is that especially with COVID-19 and um, just fatigue over a 17 day process post election, there are a lot of older folks just getting worn out. And so in order to make sure that the process, um, we could pull, for, pull from a larger pool, we, it, you have the allowance for people to not have to live in that space. And so that's really, really important for people to know because uh, we want good, reliable folks that are fair. Um, and we wanna make sure that if, again, older folks are doing it, um, it can't do it the entire time that we have some fresh legs uh, that can uh, be there. And, and that really opens up the pool for everybody. And I Very also- important. thank you, thank you. I also okay. wanna add that show that there are you know, a greater turnout with voter. There's a greater turnout vote out of, oh, there's a greater voter turnout when they are people who represent the community. So if I was in a predominantly African-American community and I'm an African-American precinct official, then more African-Americans in that community are more likely to vote. Right, right. And so along with the Theta Lambda Sigma alumni chapter, we also have the Beta Pi Sigma uh, alumni chapter of Simming Road Story Incorporated. And so uh, Theta Lambda Sigma represents Cary, North Carolina, and Beta Pi Sigma um, represents Durham, North Carolina. And for Beta Pi Sigma, we have Ashley Brown, who is the president of the alumni chapter. So, Ashley. Thank you. First, I just want to say thank you to everyone who took their time out this evening to join us and a special thank you to all of our elected representatives. Thank you so much for taking your time out to provide information. One thing I do want to uh, mention to everyone is start within your home. Start having this conversation within your home, with your children, with your family. Start educating yourselves inside your home because all that's going to do is spread the word. You're just gonna have more conversations about, you know, political stances, what, you know, impacts our communities. So we need to educate within first um, before we think we can take on the entire world. Um, so I just wanna urge everyone, as you're researching, you're educating yourself, make sure that you're talking within your own homes and especially to your children as well, because eventually they will be voting and they'll be winning um, elected positions and things like that. And then the last thing, I want you, um, everyone, to keep in mind that we will be having a NPHC candidates forum. So please stay tuned to that. When that information um, is um, finalized, we'll make sure that we send that out to everyone and um, put it on our social media platform. So NPHC of Durham and Orange County are planning a candidates forum. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, thank you. And thank you to Zach, thank you to Barbara, Thank you to Mark, thank you to Shakima, thank you to Ashley, thank you to everyone who has came out and participated in this very, very important discussion. And so uh, this conversation will be on triangleagulars.org slash time to build within the next 24 hours. Uh, there are still two more sessions uh, as part of this voter education series. Uh, the last one, I think, will be of high interest to everyone. And so if you're right on election day, uh, as was mentioned during the discussion, you go to vote and you run into resistance. What do you do? What are your options? And so we're going to get in more detail about that. So again, thank you 
thank you to everyone for coming out. Uh, I hope all of you registered to vote. Uh, if you plan to absentee ballot, I hope you have requested your forms. Um, pro tip, if you're leery about the post office, if you can, deliver it yourself. Um, and, and just a quick point, we provide a lot of information regarding North Carolina. And so I know there's a number of you who do not live in North Carolina. Uh, so to that, I say go to your respective state board of election website. Um, and if you have any questions directed to your respective state board of elections or your county board of elections, uh, there are they are a wealth of knowledge and resources. So. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Stay safe, and we will see you at the next workshop in September. Bye. Bye, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>